Have you or someone you know been called to jury duty in Judge Kimbler's court? If so, go to www.czclep.org and click on the judge's picture to get juror training. Once you're there, the judge will give you all you need to know to be a competent juror in his courtroom. It's to give you an overview of what we expect from you if you're chosen as a juror. It's free and it's easy. Just register and watch the video. This message is proudly sponsored by the Celebrezzi Zangi Community Legal Education Project, Inc., a not-for-profit Ohio corporation devoted to legal education. Hello and welcome to Law Talk. My name is John Celebrezzi and I'm the co-founder of the Celebrezzi Zangi Community Legal Education Project, as we call it CZ CLEP for short. Our organization provides continuing education about the judiciary and legislature to attorneys, judges, government officials, and the general public. As a career ed educator, I recognize early on how important legal matters are and, and how they impact our lives. I am the nephew of the late Anthony J. Celebrezzi, who was the popular five-term mayor of Cleveland and a member of President Kennedy's cabinets. As a tribute to his lifetime commitment to the legal process, we dedicate this show. Welcome to Ask the Judge, a program presented by the CZ Court Reporter, a function of CZ CLEP. John's guest today is Medina County Common Pleas Judge James Kimbler. Judge Kimbler is Medina County's longest serving judge, taking office in 1986 as the judge of the Wadsworth Municipal Court. In 1996, the judge was elected to his current position as Common Pleas Judge. Today's show will give the judge and some Medina County citizens an opportunity to explore questions about the law that are often on our minds. Welcome. I. I would like to start out today pointing out to my viewers that last time you were here, it's been a little while ago, you were celebrating your 25th year on the bench. Is that right? That's right. And that's been a couple of years ago. Yeah, I now have uh, February 10th of uh, 2013 was my uh, 27th year on the bench. Uh, the last year has probably been pretty uh, dramatic in one sense because uh, the last from March of 2012 until March of 2013, I, had, I presided over the largest uh, verdict in civil trial, which was a medical malpractice yeah. case, and I presided over the uh, death, a death penalty case, which was the first death penalty case in about 60 or 70 years in Medina County. So it's been a pretty dramatic year uh, in one sense, um, but it's been an interesting year. Yeah. Well, I guess. We'll see how you do in the second 25, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to lead the bench when I'm 70 or so. Oh, so. we got a long time for that. <laughs> well, we asked you here today because we heard and uh, uh, we know that you oftentimes come up with some innovative court programs and it's our understanding that you have a new one called, it has to do with the conduct of your jurors, is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Um, and we're going to talk about it today. Uh, I understand that uh, we have some questions. Yeah, actually we do. Uh, Kate Feeks, our CZ reporter, has been out and about as she normally is. Hi, Kate. Hi. Good morning, Kate. Good morning. And she's actually found several of your constituents, sort of people on the street, who have some questions uh, about the new program, the new juror conduct program. And we wondered if you'd be so kind to answer them today. Sure. Be okay. glad to look forward to it. Well, at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Kate. And Kate? Take it away. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, Judge Kimbler, thank you for joining us. And the first question I have for you today is from Jim, and he would like to know... Hello, Judge Kimbler. My name is Jim. Why did you produce the juror conduct video? You know, a lot of people appear for jury duty. Have, most people have never appeared for jury, jury duty at all. They have no idea what to expect. They have no idea what's going to happen to them when they come to the court. But a lot of times they're hesitant to uh, address questions to my staff because, number one, they don't want to interfere with people, um, 
doing their work. Uh, number two, they don't want to act like they don't know what's going to happen. Uh, number three, I think they're, they're not sure how this is going to be received. So what we were hoping to do was to uh, do a uh, video um, clip, so to speak, of what, we, what I expect from jurors, both in terms of their conduct and also in terms of what's going to happen to them when they come to the court, uh, what's going to be the, uh, the uh, schedule of events, so to speak. And what we're hoping to do is to decrease uh, potential jurors' anxiety so that when they come to court, they are, they are focused from the, the very start about uh, their role in the uh, criminal and civil justice system. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be very helpful. Okay, next is Tom. Hello, Judge Kimmler. My name is Tom from Medina. I was wondering where I would go to see the video if I were a prospective juror. They have to go to the ZZ, uh, Celebrezi Zangi Community Legal Education uh, Project website. That is Z, www.czclep.org. And if they look on that website, I believe on the uh, left hand side of their screen, they'll see uh, a, a picture of myself and also the words, I believe, juror conduct. They clip on that, they click on that, and then uh, there's a password. They have to give a username and a password, uh, and then they, they view the uh, film. Uh, at that point. So right now we're doing it through the Celebrezi Zangi Community Education Project, which is a uh, for non-profit Ohio corporation. Kate, if I could jump in here for a minute. Judge, what we'll do to help our viewers out on this, we'll actually show our website address okay. here uh, because that's, that's the, the gate here to get to this. So we'll put this on so prospective jurors watching the show can do that. Okay? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Kate. Okay, next I have Bill. Hi, Judge Kimbler. My name is Bill. Now, I'd like to know what are a couple of different challenges that attorneys use to remove prospective jurors? Uh, what, when people are called into the uh, courtroom for jury service, let's say we need uh, eight or uh, people on a, for a civil trial or we need 12 people for a criminal trial. Uh, I think sometimes people are kind of um, surprised to see that instead of having you know 12 people there, we have like 35 people there or 40 people there. And the reason is, uh, first of all, because we may run more than one jury trial in a week, and so we try to have we try to spread around the uh, duty, so to speak. But the second thing is, when jurors appear for jury duty, uh, even though they've been selected, uh, that is not the end of the process. The attorneys are allowed to challenge uh, the juror under two types of challenge. One is known as a challenge for cause, and the other is known as a peremptory challenge. Now, a challenge for cause, uh, each side has an unlimited number of challenges for cause, but they're for pretty narrow reasons. An example of a challenge for cause might be, let's say we had a person on the jury who was going through a divorce, and one of the attorneys was representing that person in the divorce. Well, that'd be a challenge for cause. Or if we had a person on the jury who uh, is, has a, is a relative of somebody who's appearing in the lawsuit as a party, that'd be a challenge for cause. But they're pretty narrow reasons. But the second kind of challenge is what's known as a peremptory challenge. And that's a challenge an attorney can exercise for virtually any reason, and they don't have to give a reason to the juror uh, and to the court. However, there's only four of those in a criminal case and three of those in a civil case per side. So let's say we start out with 12 people. There's a couple of challenges for cause. Each side exercises four peremptory challenges. Well, the first 12 we have, 10 of them would be gone. It would have 10 new people taking their place when we actually started the trial. So because of that, we usually have to keep around 25 to 30 for a criminal case and around 15 to 20 uh, for a civil case. Also, quite frankly, uh, although most people do appear in our summons, sometimes people are uh, unavoidably uh, delayed or uh, have to delay their jury service or their uh, commitment to us. And so that's why we have to have more than the number of people we're gonna actually going to need when the trial uh, begins. Okay. Judge, I want to ask you a question about that. I've, I've often wondered this on the uh, peremptory challenge. You could, uh, the attorney could actually take off in anybody. I mean, there is one potential um, uh, uh, check on the peremptory challenge, and that is they can. the Supreme Court of the United States has said that they cannot exercise a peremptory challenge in a way that is racially exclusive. And I'll I give see. an example of this. 
Um, during the murder case we recently we we did recently, we had one African American person on the jury. She was the only African American person on the whole jury panel. So we had potentially we had maybe two or three hundred people called for jury duty potentially that week to be interviewed, but she was the only one who was uh, of a different race than the rest of us. And so uh, a challenge of her, if there was a peremptory challenge of her, then the court, then if the other party objected to that, then the, the, the person doing the challenge would have to give to me a uh, reason why they're I exercising see. that I challenge. See. So for example, let's suppose you had a person who was a member of the African American race or, the, or was an Asian uh, race, and they're on our jury panel. And there's a. They, it, it turns out that they are um, uh, a spouse of a police officer. I see. Okay, and the prosecutor goes to peremptory challenge them, and the defense says, "Why are you doing this?" You know, or no. Well, in that case, be the way around. Let's say the defense goes to peremptory challenge and the prosecutor objects. Sure. They would come to court, and so the prosecutor would say something like, "Judge, we're challenging," or the defense would say, "Judge, we're challenging this person because they're a police officer's spouse, and we think they're going to be biased to the state." I see. In that case, I'd probably allow the challenge because that's a rational, non-racial reason why you would exclude somebody from jury service if you were an attorney for uh, the defendant. Um, but I, I, those are called Batson challenges after the name of the case in the United States Supreme Court. I've only had. Uh, twice where there's been a Batson challenge. Uh, one time was for gender and the other time was for race. The one that was for gender, I found that the attorney had a valid reason to make the challenge and so I did not um, stop the challenge or prohibit the challenge. And the one that was for race, the attorney was not able to articulate a valid reason uh, and there, therefore I did not I allow that challenge to take place. Okay. So that the, the Batson case is probably the only restriction on, the peremptory. on peremptory challenges in Ohio. And the Batson decision was the United States Supreme Court case. It was not an Ohio Supreme sure, Court. Sure, so it's going to rule. Yeah. Well, we wondered about that. It's, it's, it's very interesting. Kate, I'm sorry, I just wanted to <laughs> That's okay. seize the opportunity. <laughs> okay, sure next. Show, uh, you get the well, well, <laughs> <laughs> next is Sherry. Hi, Judge Kimbler. My name is Sherry Patterson. My question is what evidence does the jury see? Evidence can be uh, one probably of two forms. There can be what's called um, testimony, which is when a person comes in and testifies under oath. That can be done in, uh, in, in live. In certain civil cases, it can also be done by video. Uh, the second th form of evidence <coughs> is called exhibits, which are physical uh, things such as maps, diagrams, pictures, bills, uh, virtually anything you can bring into a courtroom can be an exhibit. Um, and then there is what's called circumstantial evidence, and there's what's called direct evidence. And direct evidence is when somebody testifies to something that they have experienced directly. Circumstantial evidence is when we're given direct evidence which we can infer something else happened. Um, the classical example sometimes used by lawyers is the last prospective jurors. Have you ever gone into, uh, heard a crash in your house? You go into a room, there's a lamp on the floor, and you're, both your kids are denying that they did anything. Well, you know something was done because you heard the crash. You know the lamp's on the floor because of the activity of the children. So the fact that you, even though you didn't see the lamp crash, so to speak, you heard the crash, you observed the result, that's circumstantial evidence. And in Ohio, um, a lot of jurors, there used to be the idea that jurors thought or people thought that you couldn't base a criminal conviction solely on circumstantial evidence. That is not true. Uh, circumstantial evidence is um, every bit as valid as, as direct evidence. And indeed, there are certain lawyers who try cases who would argue that circumstantial evidence is more reliable because usually the person giving you the direct evidence from which you're making the inference really has no motivation to mm -hmm. either lie or to misrepresent the evidence because they don't know that it's going to be used to make an inference, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Interesting. Okay, next is Jay. Hi, Judge Kimbler. My name is Jay Goodman from Medina. My question for you is, describe the job of the jury as compared to your job. Well, we have this kind of uh, division of labor in a, in a court trial, or in a jury trial rather. Uh, the jury decides the issues of fact, and I decide the issues of law and procedure. So um, the best way I can, I can think of it is, 
Uh, when we try a jury trial, I have the umpire role. That is, I have to make sure the evidence that the jury receives is based on the law in Ohio. I have to uh, make sure the lawyers uh, obey um, their uh, procedural rules. Uh, I have to keep the trial going um, smoothly. But it is not my job to decide issues of fact. So what does that mean? Well, let's say we had a case, for example, where um, there is a stop, there's a collision at an intersection, and both parties are saying that I had the stop sign, okay, or I had the, I had the green light. And both parties say I had the green light. We know one of the parties did not have the green light because the crash took place. Um, it's the jury's job to decide whether or not, um, or is decide which party wins the case by deciding which party had the green light, okay? Mm -hmm. It's not my job to decide that. So, for example, if somebody wants to introduce evidence of how the light functions and there's an objection to that evidence, then my ruling would determine whether or not the jury hears that evidence. But as far as determining the issue of who had the green light, that is a factual issue and that's determined by the jury. So it's kind of this division of labor between, jur between juries and judges. And indeed, one of the things we, we instruct the jury at the end of the trial is I will tell the jury, if you think that I have indicated to you as a judge what the, what the, the facts should be, you've got to disregard that because that's your role, not my role. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, we have to be very careful as judges when we try cases uh, not to intrude upon the role of the jury and not indicate how we think a factual issue should be decided. Okay. Good answer.